guys, welcome back to another edition of Chats from the Blog Cabin. Today I'm joined by I want to I don't want to say repeat offender because you're not an offender, but repeat <laughs> guest, Ashley. Ashley was part of my women and race panel, which I appreciate her so much for coming on that panel. But I knew I wanted to have her back on individually because she's just an amazing person. So Ashley, why don't you tell my viewers a little bit about yourself? Oh, well, thank you so much again for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. But for those who may not be familiar with me, I'm actually from Mount Olive, North Carolina, which is not far from where Melissa's from. Um, I'm a country girl, but I am the creator of Fab Ellis. And Fab Ellis is an affordable beauty style and lifestyle uh, channel. So for me, my main topic is really helping women feel fabulous inside and out. And a lot of times that's showing you how to do that on a budget. So my big thing, I'm a big thrifter. I'm a couponer. I am a clearance shopper. I will never be afraid to tell you how much I bought something for because it most likely was very affordable. Uh, and I also am an affordable traveler as well. Pre-COVID, uh, a lot of people don't realize that I used to cover travel at least one to two times on my blog as well. So uh, that is the gist of it. But I know we'll get more into it. Yeah. So you talk about thrifting. Where did that passion come from? Because, I mean, you're a passionate thrifter. <laughs> I am. You know, the funny part is the thrifting came from the person we were just talking about, my mom. Um, I still remember being mm, probably four or five years old and going to the consignment shop with my mom. My mom always had just impeccable style when she worked in an office. And she, a lot of times she would consign her clothing. So I would go with her when I was little. And as I got older, um, my love for fashion developed. But growing in growing up in a single parent household, I really didn't have the money to really spend a lot on things like that. So I remember thinking to myself as I was going through magazines and stuff, I was like, wait, I can recreate these things with the type of stuff I saw at the consignment shop or that I saw at Goodwill and create the uh, looks that I'm going for. So it really started uh, I started seeing it when I was in elementary school, but my passion really came in high school. I actually was a thrifter in high school. Wow. Do you think because you were raised by a single parent that you're stronger because of that and you actually value dollar more because you saw, like you said, struggle a little bit? Yeah, I do. But you know what, too? It's funny because it's almost like uh, it's the opposite sometimes, too. Sometimes I'm more likely to splurge now as an adult because I couldn't when I was younger, but I do think I definitely, definitely see the value in a dollar because before I do splurge, it is a long thought process. Like I, I do have a few luxury brand pieces and before I purchased many of them, I took maybe one to two years to think about it, which I think some people think is crazy, <laughs> but I took time to think about it because I knew it was so much money at one time. Yeah, I know there's um, one wallet that I wanted for the longest time, and I waited until I got a gift card to get it. And that was the hobo mm -hmm. wallet. I don't know if you've ever heard of a hobo wallet, which is the wallet that opens up, and you can basically, it's basically a whole purse by itself. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. But they're really expensive. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to wait and wait and wait and wait. And finally, they came on sale, and I had a gift card. So I'm like, yep, I earned it. So. <laughs> and a lot, of people, a lot of people don't realize, too, sometimes those – uh, investments are actually good because some brands like um, like Gucci and Louis Vuitton and things like that can be passed down because my mother has passed down things to me. So um, they don't realize that's actually a good investment, too. And they're probably better quality as well. Am I correct? Uh, yes, very much so. That, and that's funny that you say that, too, because a lot of times people don't realize that's one reason why I thrift. The quality sometimes is so much better than what we call fast fashion today. Mm -hmm. um, things are made so cheaply today, but if you really go and you thrift things that are from the 70s and 80s and early 90s, that quality is just so much better. Yeah, and um, so what's your biggest thrift that you've gotten, your your biggest find that you would say you've gotten? My biggest find? Um, let me see. Well, I'll be honest with you. I haven't really found because when I when I am thrifting, I'm not really thrifting for uh, like luxury, luxury pieces, because if I were to do that, I would necessarily go to like a consignment shop. But when I'm thrifting, I'm thrifting for things that are really unique and beautiful. And I think probably some of my best finds were I found like a rainbow skirt one time, but it was really unique because it kind of had um, 
kind of like a trumpet hem. It was kind of form fitting and then it has like a little flare at the end. Um, trying to think. Some of the best ones though were actually not found by me. They were gifts from my mom. Oh. Uh, yeah, my mom thrifts uh, all the time. Like I'm talking about weekly. <laughs> cool. And she thrifts um, where I'm from. She thrifts in Goldsboro. She thrifts uh, in multiple places weekly. So there are some things that she's given me that I love. But the number one thing that I can think of right now that I love is she found me a lipstick brooch. Oh, oh that's cool. <laughs> yeah, because everybody knows I love lipstick and I love makeup. So uh, when she found that, I was just like, I never would find anything like that before in my life. Now, when you go in thrift, do you go in with a specific piece in mind or do you just go, go with an open mind? Nine times out of ten, I'm going with an open mind because... I now I do have like a maybe a mental list of things that I do love to get at the, the thrift store. Like for me, the number one thing I love to get at the thrift store, I love to get T-shirts like men's graphic T-shirts or women's graphic T-shirts. I love to get blazers. I love to get housewares like my mom has given me um, drinking glasses from the thrift store that are just beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, but I always have like a mental list of things that I'm like, OK, go check here. Go check here before you leave. But most of the time, I just go in with an open mind because I just want to see what they have because you never know what you'll find. That is so true. And I mean, if you guys follow her on Instagram, she will take you thrifting with her when she goes. <laughs> I know. I've been missing it so much because of COVID. I've only been one time, I think, in the past maybe four months or five months. So, yeah. Yeah, she actually turned me on to a, one of the thrift stores up toward the Greensboro, Winston-Salem area. and We actually went when we were visiting our daughters, I think last year. Did so, you go? Yeah, we did go. We didn't, Michaela found us some stuff, but I didn't find anything I like, which is unusual okay. for me. But yeah, Michaela found some stuff. And Gracie, Gracie's my big thrifter, my youngest. She like, okay. yesterday, she's like, this, this, this skirt looks like Armani, but I paid $2 for it. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> See, that's me. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. So, Let's talk about fashion styling now. So we talked about thrifting and recreating your items like in a fashion magazine through thrifting mm -hmm. and how, how you made it affordable. And you've also taken it on to your brand as well. Right. So let's talk about how you turned that into your whole brand. Uh, the thrifting aspect? Uh -huh. Well, you know, it's just interesting because some things just kind of, they just kind of fell into place. A lot of people don't realize when I first started thrifting, I mean, excuse me, when I first started my blog, it was mainly about beauty because beauty is another uh, passion of mine. So people, uh, you know, originally just came to me to, for beauty. And then as people were adding more subjects to their blogs and stuff like that, I eventually was like, okay, I love fashion. I love thrifting, but are people going to want to actually see it? <laughs> I don't know. And it really just became like a gradual process. Like over time, I would just be like, hey, here's how I styled this skirt or this shirt for $2 or $5. And the feedback that I got was just crazy. So what I started to do was I just started to implement that like all the time. I would even create videos of me going to the thrift store, I would show how I style stuff. And it just happened very naturally. It was kind of like I was testing the waters to see if people would be interested and they loved it. So it just gradually started, you know, being added all the time. And in fact, I love when I can go thrifting and do the um, Instagram stories or Instagram lives in the thrift store. Um, now, also, you kind of turned that into name brands working with you, like this particular picture Target. Tell us how that worked out. Yeah, well, and actually the funny thing with that, a lot of people don't realize, and I and I don't mind sharing it here with you, but a lot of people don't realize that picture was from a campaign that never went live. Oh. Um, yeah, what ended up happening was just because there were, during that time, there was a lot of um, issues going on with the racial injustices, and there was just a lot going on in the climate of America. And I believe Target felt like it just wasn't the right time. And because it was a designer collection that was already set to come out, they just decided that the campaign itself wouldn't go live, but they still had the designer collection come out. 
Um, but a lot of people don't realize, but now they'll know this is actually a picture that was left over from that. Um, I'm grateful that for that opportunity. I hope I can get to work with them again, but that one didn't go live. But it has, you know, come to be that I have been able to work with uh, other brands. I, I've worked with uh, Kato's. I've worked with, um, trying to think in terms of clothes, I've worked with JCPenney several times. And I think those things came about because of the affordability. Those are two brands that we know are very affordable, very easy to find great outfits in. And I think they just found me online and we just started partnerships. And I actually have worked with both of them, I think, for about two years or more on various projects. Well, that is awesome. I mean, first of all, you can tell you're you're beautiful. You're a beautiful woman inside and out. But I Thank love you. how you're so comfortable in your own skin. You know, Thank a lot you. of people aren't comfortable in being out there and showing anything, any part of their body, but you're like so open and honest and you're such a role model for, for women. So was that, was that a lot of, um, being raised by a single mom? Does she instill that self-esteem in you? Or is that something that you kind of have struggled with and you've just come out about? Yeah, well, actually, you know, the interesting thing with my mom is that my mom and I, we have had We've had a lot of growth in our relationship as mom and daughter, because one of the things that my mom very much instilled on, it wasn't always about looks with my mom. My mom was very much like, I remember so vividly her always saying to me, pretty is as, is as pretty does. So um, for me, my biggest thing was I wanted to make sure that I was just as beautiful on the inside as I was on the outside. And it took some time, though, to learn to really love myself and feel confident in myself. I would say I probably didn't really feel truly feel confident in who I am, maybe until my mid 20s, uh, because I just had a lot of things that I had to go through. A lot of people don't realize that, you know, when you grow up in a single parent household, you don't have a father there. There are a lot of things that you know, you don't learn from um, having a male role in your life. And so sometimes you can devalue yourself in a way. So I really had to learn to truly love myself. And I really got to a point where I was just like, you know what, this is the only life I live. I really believe that everything that God creates is beautiful and good. And I, I only have this one life. So I'm just going to start living it and loving myself and that whoever I let into my life loves and values me as much as I do as well. Well, speaking of love and value, I, like I told you right before we hopped on, mm -hmm. When you shared that little thing about your husband having you as his screensaver, that just like touched my heart so much. You could tell him that he really loves you and the way he was just laughing at the video that you shared this past weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And you know, uh, a lot of people don't realize, I've been, about, I've been with my husband for eight years. We've been married for six, but we've been together for eight. And he is just the most awesome person. He always has made me feel loved and cared for since day one. And that's why I try to share those little tidbits too, because I hope it encourages people to wait for the right person. Now, would you say he's your biggest fan? <laughs> yes, <laughs> he definitely is. Although if he was here, he probably would be like, I don't know. Cause she, she kicked me out from being her, for her photographer. He used to take my pictures at okay. one point. Yeah. He used to take my pictures, but then I hired a professional uh, photographer to start taking the majority of them. He still takes some, um, but she takes the majority, but I would say definitely he's my biggest fan. He's been there since I had maybe less than a thousand followers on Instagram and now I have over 21 K. So that's amazing. Yeah. I did. The first time we met was on the blogger tour, right? The winery yeah. tour. Mm -hmm, the wine. Yeah. yeah. I had, um, Habiba on last week with her husband and her husband, I was talking about how Habiba was just so sweet and he's like, yeah. He said, you had a lot of wine that day. That's why you think I'm her biggest fan. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I love it. So it's really funny. So let's talk about why it's important for companies to show diversity in advertising, not only to show different people of different races, but also different sizes. Yeah. Well, it's definitely important because I think that a lot of people, a lot of companies don't realize that. Not that everything is about money, but the way you really, truly reach uh, audience and gain more money in your business is by showing different body types. Everyone is not the same. Everyone doesn't look the same. And it is so important to really show the different uh, skin tones and things like that. And I think for me, 
you would be surprised because you actually women, especially I know can, I can say for myself, I gravitate towards companies that are actually willing to use uh, pictures of women who look like me. So I know I spend a lot with companies like Target because they're constantly showing different body types, especially on their website. But it's just important because it, it helps people see themselves and also it, see, it helps them see themselves using their products, using uh, wearing the clothes, things like that. I mean, I love this one title. It says three life ha hacks for thicker ankles. You wouldn't have think of anybody writing that or writing a post like that. Oh my gosh. You, you know what? It's so funny because I thought of that one day because I was like, people don't realize having thicker ankles is a struggle sometimes, but you know, finding those tips that I shared there, like, you know, going to a shoe repair store and finding out that they can um, extend the strap on, on sandals and shoes or, finding out that you can use necklace extenders to extend anklets and necklaces so that they'll fit around your ankle. Things like that are just things I discovered over time. And I'm like, I had to share that with people. Yeah, that is so cool. Um, also, let's talk about um, what's the camp that you went to that you obviously didn't go to this year, but you went last year. Oh yeah. I've actually been two years in a row. It's called Fat Camp. It's it was made by Annette Richmond. She's the creator of a of a Facebook group and a website called Fat Girls Traveling. But she created this group, uh, excuse me, this um, event the year before last. And it's actually a lot of people get cringe where you know when they hear Fat mm -hmm. Camp, but it's actually not the type of Fat Camp that people would assume. It is actually a body positive camp, and it's a um, I would say it's about three days, three days uh, camp in Camp Pinewood, which is in Hendersonville, North Carolina, up in the mountains. Beautiful drive up there, honestly. But it's three days. It includes activities like, like camp, like when you're little, like making necklaces or painting rocks with positive messages. And in fact, I actually have my rock I made the first year I was there. It says stay fab on it. Oh, I love that. Yeah, we made these, but just different little like camp activities, even tie dye shirts. But it's all about um, really not only enjoying yourself and having a positive camp experience as an adult, but it's really supposed to just reinforce that positivity uh, as far as, you know, loving yourself and being body positive. Because not only that, she also has speaking parts, which is why I was there. The first time I was there, I was talking about, um, I just want to say, I think my journey as far as body positivity, but the second time I was there, I, it was a panel of people who are all married or in relationships and talking about how you navigate being in a relationship as a plus size person. So it was, it's awesome. So did your husband go to that one or was it just women only? No, it's just women only. Okay. Cause mm -hmm. I thought that would be really cool to hear the male point of view of, of loving a plus size person. Yeah, yeah. No, this time it was only for women. But that is something that I think would be great. In fact, you know, I think earlier this year, I was going to be on a panel uh, that was similar to that where my husband was going to be a part, but it was canceled, of course, due to COVID. It was a different event. Uh, but I think that would be great too to hear those perspectives, because I think my husband, he just loves me so naturally. But I'm like, I think it would be encouraging for other women to really hear his uh, point of view and even other men too. Yeah, especially other women, because a lot of women don't think because they're a bigger size, because of the way society's made them feel that mm -hmm. they're not worthy of love. And I really think that's something that needs to be kicked to the out the door in the trash and burned or whatever and just thrown away. <laughs> <laughs> I know because I even said on my Facebook, I think maybe a month or so ago, I'm like, you all do realize that a lot of men actually like plus size women, right? Because there's this like stereotype that a lot of men don't like plus size women. But, you know, in my lifetime, it's never really been an issue. So I don't know why people think that. I, I just think it's because society, it's like yeah. everybody wants to, they strive to be like the Victoria's Secret model, which now, don't they have a plus size model now? I think they do, but I'll be honest with you. I don't think it was really uh, received in a positive yeah. light because it took them so long to do so. <laughs> so, yeah. So tell me exactly what do you want your readers to, or someone coming to your site for the first time, what do you want them to feel 
when they've come to either to your Instagram or your Facebook or your site, how do you want them to receive what you're saying? Yeah, well, I want them to definitely, I don't know. I think I really want people to feel inspired to love themselves and kind of go out of the box. I think for me, one of the things I am really happy that I embrace about myself is that I am kind of quirky and, <laughs> and outside of the box. And I think that I love the fact that when you come to my website or you come to my Instagram, you're not only going to get maybe a little bit of style, but you're going to get some inspiration in that too. And I really hope that women come to it and see not only these outfits, but see how they can really love themselves a little bit more. And then too, um, I really hope it does inspire them to try different styles. I think that so many times people are just in one box, but for me, I love uh, feminine styles. I love sneakers. I love you know, dressing up, dressing down. And I think I, I love to show that there's different aspects to women. So I hope it makes them feel inspired to try new things and then inspired to really deep, dig deep and love themselves a little bit more too. Now I have to ask you, how many times do you take a photo before you actually post it? Because I know yeah. normally we like like a thousand selfies or a thousand pictures before we get the right pose. So Yeah. If I'm actually taking the picture, it's probably going to be maybe maybe at least 20, 25 times. But with my photographer, um, she that and that's why I hired her too, because I, I wanted to take the effort out of like trying to figure out, okay, how many times do I have to take the picture? Do I have to do the angle this way or do the angle this way? I love it because when she takes my pictures, I just go through and click what I like and then she delivers it. And that's it, you know? Um, but when I'm taking it, it can be like 25, <laughs> 25 pictures or so. Because we're our, we're our own worst critics, right? We are. And it's so funny because I'll have like my husband take a picture and he'll take like 20 pictures, but I end up choosing like the first one he picked. And I'm like, why didn't I, why did I make him keep taking pictures? It's because you just want, just in case that perfect pose comes across. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, why do I do that? But that's just what we do. <laughs> now, um, I can need to take a quick break real quick to do a commercial, but we'll be right back guys. Okay. Hey y'all, welcome to Summer Sunflower Fields at Odin Farming Company. We'd love for you to come visit with us. We're open Tuesday through Thursday and Sunday from 4 to 8 and Friday and Saturday from 4 to 9. $5 admission includes a visit with the pasture gang, the playground, the beautiful fields, and three flowers to carry home. So come see us at 1426 Claridge Nursery Road, Goldsboro. Check out our website, odomfarmingcompany.com, or follow us on social media. We sure hope to see you soon. Now, that's the place you need to come when you come down to visit your mom, if you come down soon. I know. I I was just sitting there thinking, I'm like, you always talk about that place. And I'm like, I want to go, but I've never been. Yeah, there are sunflowers. There are actually sunflowers have just started. Um, they had one field that's about ready to go down. Another field is blooming. And then they have another one and that's going in the back. So they'll be great for pictures. So... Oh, yeah, yeah, I definitely want to come and see it because I always see you talking about it. And I hate that I haven't been able to come to the uh, blogger events that they were having yeah. at one point because I'm like, I really want to go. But it's on my list, too. Now, look, you've given me two places I got to go now. <laughs> and they socially distance, too. So, OK, pretty much outdoors. So, OK, well, that's good. It, look, I have to go in the morning because it's so hot. Either that or toward later in the evening. Okay. Because the, okay. the sunsets are beautiful on the farm and you'll see the sunflowers. It's gorgeous. Okay. Yeah. Look, it's on my list now. <laughs> so let's talk about the importance of being authentic online and offline. Like I know with you, what I see is what I get online, offline. You're the same person mm -hmm. as you are online as you are offline. So how important is that for especially bloggers to be? Oh my gosh, it's huge. But, you know, at this time, I think now the unfortunate thing is there's a lot of, you know, kind of like a fake reality on social media right now. And I feel like it gives, it's it's not great, you know, to, to be inauthentic because you don't realize how much people are looking to you. And, you know, I know that people want to just create this this false reality online, but really in this day and age, especially right now, People just need the real people need just a real person being real with who themselves. And I feel like when you show who you authentically are, not only do you gain 
readers and followers who truly, truly will um, love what you're doing and stay with you, but it creates more of a community. I can't tell you how many people I just honestly don't follow online. Like I love their work, but you know, if I just don't get that authentic vibe or get that, that realness from you, like telling me who you really are, I just can't follow you. So it's huge. And I think brands love seeing that authentic person too. I think that's what really, you know, has helped me create these long-term partnerships with certain brands because I've just, just been myself from day one. So when did you start blogging? Oh, I actually started blogging in 2010. Wow. So yeah, I started, (laughs) I started blogging in 2010, but it was not, it was nowhere near like what I'm doing now. It wasn't like, um, really something I took seriously. It was just something I wrote. I wrote up there every now and again, just like a journal. I didn't really get serious with it till maybe 2012. And that's when I started seeing that you could make money from blogging. And so are you full-time now or you still have a full-time job and do this part-time or? Well, I actually do this full time. I do work part time about 10, 15 hours outside of the house. Um, That's something that I try to tell people. I'm very open about. I could not do the being at home every day. Mm -hmm. I tried. (laughs) I tried. But that human interaction was something that I really, really missed. And I know, you know, at the time when I went um, full time, they weren't really having a lot of like the co-working spaces and stuff like that, like they have now. So I was like, okay. I have to have a way to get some human interaction. What could I do? So that's how I started working at Lane Bryant part time. But that actually works out great because that's, you know, that's fashion and styling for me outside of the home. Now, have you ever been able to work on campaigns for Lane Bryant because you work for Lane Bryant? Unfortunately, no, that is against their policy. So I'm not able to. Um, But what they did is what they did start maybe late last year was they actually have a styling program. So they actually have stylists at every store. Right now, we're not able to do it because of COVID. But one of the things that they did with the styling program is I would actually have clients that would come in and I would be able to spend one on one time with them for maybe an hour to an hour and a half and styling them. And I got a lot of joy out of that because it was, you know, a little bit different than what I usually do there. So it was really nice. And probably seeing somebody's face light up when you pick out an outfit that you choose for them and watch, yeah. they think, Oh my goodness, I'm never going to be able to wear that. And then they put it on. And they're like, light bulbs go off. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I've had that. I, I've had that pretty much every time I've styled someone. I styled maybe four or five ladies before all of this started because it was a it was fairly brand new at the time before COVID started. So it was brand new. And so I had a few ladies that came in and one lady, she was just like, well, I'm just going to come see you every season now because I literally got her entire winter outfit together, her, her entire winter wardrobe together. That is so awesome. I mean, you don't think a lot about that. The fact, pretty much when you go shopping, you think, I know what I want. But sometimes what you want doesn't always look great on you. And so it's yeah. helpful for someone like you. And, you know, it's also awesome, too, because in the midst of all of that, a lot of people don't realize I am actually a master bra fitter as well. So I'm really big on making sure women have the right size bra. And then, too, I found that one of the things I was noticing a lot when I was styling women, women were wearing clothes that were too big for them. Uh, A lot of times and I get it. You know, sometimes we as women, we may want to, you know, kind of cover ourselves. We don't want things that are too tight. But a lot of women didn't realize that they were actually making themselves look larger by wearing clothes that were too big versus wearing the right size. And also there are always clothes that can kind of accommodate what you're looking for. Like if you don't want to show your belly, there are things that we can do to, to hide that. You don't have to wear things that are too big to do that. So it, it's, it was, it was great because a lot of people realized, you know, they weren't wearing the right size bra or clothing. Wow. And I mean, that's my, that's my biggest thing is bras. I'm like, I cannot find one to fit me. What's, I mean, as soon as I'm home, it comes off. I mean, I just, I can't believe I just <laughs> But seriously, I'm one of these people that if I get if I didn't have to wear one, I would not wear one at all because it because it hurt. To be honest, I'll be honest. When when I started at Lane Bryant, because I've been at Lane Bryant for almost four years, 
So when I started there four years ago, I wasn't wearing the right bra. And I was like that, too. I was always like, OK, I just, like, this has got to come off. But when I was introduced to Lane Bryant bras, that all stopped. I've never had an uncomfortable bra anymore since then. It's just about finding the right style and the right size. Let's see. Maybe I need to come visit you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they do have the Lane Bryant there in um, Goldsboro, but I'd be happy to do it for you. Yeah, and actually. Actually, I hate it right now because I can't really physically do it. I can only demonstrate it because of COVID. Oh, all oh, that kind of stinks. Are yeah. you have you happened to wear a mask when you're in working now too? I am, I am. But you know, it's so funny because I always try to wear these stylish masks when I'm working because I'm like, okay, if I have to wear it all day, then I'm gonna make it look cute. <laughs> yeah, I can see you. I bet you spend quite a penny, or did you thrift some of these masks out? No, I actually bought all of them. But what I did, they weren't too bad. Um, there is a young lady in Charlotte. Her website is called Pardon My Fro. She makes a lot of Afrocentric type of things. And I bought three from her and they were like $15 a piece. But they wash up really well. Like I've washed them, se washed one like several times. I'm waiting for the other two to come. Um, but they wash well and they're worth it and they're breathable. A lot of the ones that people are making, I can't breathe in those at work. I know I've got one that has like a the cloth filter inside and I can't breathe through those. I just, mm -hmm. it just separates. And then of course, when you have your glasses and you try to put them on, your glasses fog up and you're like, oh, whatever. I know, I know. And I'm like, I'm waiting because I actually wear glasses too. I'm waiting for my new glasses to come in and I'm like, I don't know how this is going to work, but okay. <laughs> she gave me a tip the other day. Put the mask on, then put your glasses on. She says if okay. you put the, the, glass, the mask on over your glasses, that's when they'll fog up. But if you put your mask on first and then put your glasses on, then that works. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to try that. All the time. And she is like my definite mask person. Every time she walks out of the house, she's got that mask on. I mean, I was wow. really surprised that she didn't eat through her mask the other day when we went to dinner. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, have you been buying your mask locally or making them yourself? Um, actually I bought one off of Jane.com, which okay. is one of my favorite places. But, um, one of the former guidance counselors at the elementary school I used to work at, her daughter started making them. And so I got a cow print one with adventure oh. approval mom vinyled on it. So I have my brand on my mask. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what I want next. I like the ones that I have, but I saw, I know someone who's making them now and like kind of putting people's brand up there. And I was like, I need to do that next. Yes, because then you have a whole photo shoot that way, too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How you can make your mask stylish. There you go. I already gave you a tip. <laughs> I look, hey, I'll take that, too, because, look, that's, that, that's a real thing right now. Yeah, it is a real thing. I mean, I had a friend of mine that she just eloped to Savannah, and her mom made masks for the rubber ducks. Because oh. the ducks are a big thing. They made little, like, diamond studded mask no yes you know rhinestone studded mask for the, yeah. the bride and then like a black mask with like a little tie for the for the um the groom duck because the ducks are such a big thing with them yeah so, that's so cute look i can only imagine trying to get married with all this stuff going on and can you imagine being pregnant with all this stuff going on too no. And I actually know a few people who have given birth throughout this. And I'm like, wow, I can only imagine. Yeah, because I had a, a first time mom on a couple of weeks ago and she talked about how, you know, you know, when you're pregnant, you look forward to doing when you're having your first child, you look forward to so many things you're doing with your husband. And now you can't do it with your husband or your significant other because they're only allowing one person and that's you to go in. So it's it's really I can understand the, the 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 grieving kind of process that people are going through too, because it's like so many things you were looking forward to, you just can't do. Yeah, especially like graduations, weddings, everything. That's one of the very first um, chats from the block cabin I did was with a mental health therapist, and she mm -hmm. talked about you know everybody grieving and the cases of you know child abuse cases are going down. But that's only because there's, the eyes aren't on the kids anymore, the ones that would report about the child abuse cases. And I was like, wow, I never even thought about that. I wouldn't have thought about that either. That's, that's, that's crazy. Wow. That's very sad. Now let's talk about 
our little chat that we had with the whole group. And I will say, I think, again, thank you so much for coming on that chat about um, race. And you were so well-spoken. I learned a lot from you and Rada both. I mean, really, really a lot. So let's just talk about some, maybe some misconceptions that we can clear up today. Yeah. And actually, I was going to say thank you again for having me on with that, too, because uh, I learned a lot myself and I learned a lot from Rita, too, because I think uh, and I, I haven't gotten the chance to talk to her since then. But I wanted to really let her know that she really put a lot of things into words that I didn't know how to put into words. Like one of the blog posts that I really want to do and I procrastinated on it, I need to do it, is that. I never really realized that for a lot of my friends of different races, I'm what they would call uh, their safe black friend. Mm -hmm. And so they don't, you know, look at me the same way they may look at other African-Americans because they just think, oh, Ashley's safe. She's different. And I'm like, no, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm still black. <laughs> you know, yeah. at the end of the day. <laughs> so, you know, but I never knew the words to, to how to describe that and what what that was. And so she really put that into the perfect words for me. Um, but I definitely that was a great discussion. I feel like, you know, as far as some of the miscommunication or misconceptions, one of the things I wanted to talk about was, you know, how we were talking about advertisers and diversity and stuff like that. One of the things I hate in the blogging world is that I feel like a lot of advertisers feel like they can't gain anything from using black influencers. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, we as as a as a black influencer, a lot of times we are lowballed um, when it comes to paid campaigns. A lot of times we are skipped over for paid campaigns. And I remember even having a conversation with someone and they just couldn't believe what I was saying. They were like, oh, but if you have a media kid and you have all this, it sh these things shouldn't be happening. I was like, no. It it has nothing to do with a media kit. <laughs> it doesn't. It has to do with what I look like and, and what I and what they think. Because, you know, if you go to a lot of brands pages, they have very few uh, black models or black influencers on their pages. If you, For every maybe 50 pictures, you may have one black person. All the rest are just, you know, you know, not us. <laughs> so and and that one picture usually always has less likes than all the other pictures. So I think, you know, for me, one of the things is I want I want more advertisers to know that black influencers have influence. Mm -hmm. I know so many influencers like myself and a, a girl named D Lolo, another girl named Melissa Chanel. They are both originally from North Carolina and they I mean, the influence they have is crazy. I think a lot of times people feel like, oh, well, if I don't get a lot of clicks or a lot of buys immediately from a partnership with a black influencer. Oh, it was purposeless. No, a lot of times I feel like for me, my audience has to get to know the product. They have to get to know it over time, see it repeatedly before they're like, oh, OK, let me check into this. Um, so that was one of the great things when I worked with Stitch Fix for a greater majority of last year. So many people were new to Stitch Fix. And the thing I love was I worked with Stitch Fix about five times in one year. So people really got to know who Stitch Fix was. And I'm glad that Stitch Fix gave me the time to really build that rapport with my audience and allow them to get to know them. But, you know, there is a lot of value in the black audience and I hate that people overlook it so much. I know I have, um, last week I had Nicole from the doctorette. I don't know if you're familiar with her, mm -hmm. but she is a fashion. I want to say fashion, but she's also social injustice. And she's okay. actually, she's a white woman. And but she's had a writer now that she puts out to any company that contacts her. She wants to see what their inclusion policy is, what, you know, how many people. And she's like, if it doesn't line up with her, she'll say, sorry, it's not working. I won't work with you. And mm -hmm. people have come back. She said, so far, she's only had to send it out twice since she started it. But she said that people have come back with really positive and giving their detailed reports on what they're doing. So maybe that's what we need to call companies out for is people that are, are, aren't black to say, hey, look, what are your inclusion policies? Why, why, are, why are you not paying our counterparts the same amount as you're paying mm -hmm. us? 
And you know what? Believe it or not, a lot of that has started happening. There is a, and I and I hate I cannot remember the name of it. Um, but there's an Instagram account that has like started cataloging like the brands who are showing their policies, uh, what diversity looks like within their business and stuff like that. And I love that. And there have been um companies or excuse me, groups of bloggers who have called out companies for the the lack of diversity or not paying what they're paying other influencers. Um, I, I know one company that has been called out a lot is Anthropology. Mm-hmm. Um, Anthropology, which is, is, is interesting. If you go to their Instagram and look at some of their, their past posts, some of the conversations going on in the comments is crazy. But, you know, they have been called out for the lack of diversity influencers and influencers um, apparently even having a derogatory name or a, a code name I think they use for black customers it just, it's, it's just oh, crazy wow. yeah. yeah I've not heard of that so that's definitely what I'm going to check into because yeah, that's, how we learn. that's how we learn from each other is we sit down and have conversations like this instead of everybody yelling and, and back and forth at each other and we sit down and we listen and open our ears and open our mouths to talk and have intelligent conversations with each other Yeah. And I'm grateful that you have been one to really be open to having the conversation because the reality is, honestly, a lot of people are not very open to it. And a lot of people as well. And I hate to say this, but a lot of it, a lot of it has been what what I would call fake allyship. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there have been this there's this influx of, hey, I want to show you guys that that I'm inclusive. So, hey, I want you to follow these black creators over here but a lot of times those people who would maybe share my share me as a a creator to to follow those people don't even follow me themselves oh wow yes that has happened probably five or six times in the past month or so and i'm just like wow so So what do you do do you call them out for not following you or just let it go um well, to be honest, I I said something in the beginning, but now I just let it go. I don't. But what I do is I don't engage with the post. So you know, because I don't want people to get that fake sense of, oh, well, Ashley, Ashley must must know this girl, and she's she's cool. No, <laughs> no, I don't. So I just don't engage with it because, to be honest, it's really sad and it's unfortunate that people feel like they have to uh do this kind of fakeness to to seem inclusive it's okay like if you if you don't want to um highlight black creators you don't have to because i would rather you do it from an authentic place i mean honestly i don't even i've told you this before i do see your color but i don't let that define how i'm going to treat you regardless i mean i mean because honestly obviously because my husband's hispanic he's from mexico so you know we've always taught my girls that growing up, you know, we don't care who you love. You can love, you know, someone from a different sexual orientation. You could love someone that's a different color than you, different nationality from you, a different religion. All we care about is how they treat you. And if they treat you okay, then you're fine. And I Mm -hmm. think that comes across with how they grow out into the world and their views of the world now. And they see the injustice of some of their friends that are brought up mainly in a predominantly white family with hardly any um, people of color around them. And they don't, they don't see it. Mm -hmm. They just don't understand the white privilege and the girl. And sometimes I will say, sometimes I get kind of mad because they, (laughs) do because I'm the only full white one in the family. And so they will say white privilege. And I'm like, well, you don't understand. And, you know, and I tried it and I'm like, okay, I'm going to just get to the point where I just let them talk and let them say how they're doing. Because yeah. I'm always the type of person when I could see kind of both sides of the story. Because I guess because I've lived both sides of the story. Yeah. Yeah. I um. But it. I love though that you're just that you're open to it, and I love that you've taught your girls that because a lot of it just really starts at home. Um. You know, it's it always interesting to me because for me, I'm very like because you've met me, I'm very open and, and open to everyone. And but the reality is my mother is in her 70s and she grew up in segregation and she could very well tell me, um, you know, Ashley, you shouldn't associate with these people or whatever. My mom has always been like, you love people, whoever they are, you be open to them. She very well could have taught me that, but she never has. And she has told me stories of walking down the street and being called an N word as a 
child and a high schooler and stuff like that. And I'm like, she always told me to be open and loving to people. So it's, it's shameful to me that I see people who um, haven't had to experience that, you know, and they grow and they just, yet they're teaching hate and stuff like that to people. It just, it's frustrating. I know. And it's like, they're teaching it be only because the color of the skin. And that's right. what I don't get. I'm like, what if they see you and they know, you know, I'm not about to cry on this one. They see you and they know you, they know that you're such a positive person. You're such a authentic person. You're like, I want to be your best friend all the time. <laughs> I want to be more, you know, and mm -hmm. it's just, and then there's so many people, women of color that are in the blogging community. They're so embracing of everybody and yeah. embracing of other 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 women, not just of their same color, you know, because right. there is segregation as far as bloggers go. Sometimes it's only oh, we're only associating with the white bloggers, or we're only associating right. with the black bloggers. But I think with us, kind of like it's a we kind of blur the lines. We don't have a line that we segregate. Yeah, and I and I and I'm so appreciative of that because you know I have been to blogging events where I felt very uncomfortable because I was maybe one of just a few black influencers there and people weren't talking to me. They weren't open to talking to me. So, you know, I've, I've felt that. And it's crazy because I'm like, just being open is what allowed me and you to begin having a conversation and allowed us to be friends beyond that. So it's just, it's crazy to me. Um, honestly, um, I would say I want to give Kate and Andrea from NC social the, the hookup, I should say, or the, what's the word I want to look? The applause for actually getting us together because they made us all switch seats, remember, on the winery tour? Oh, I forgot about that. Sit next to the person that we know. Yes. So we had to switch. Okay. Seats. So we had to meet and talk to, we were kind of forced to talk to each other. <laughs> to talk to you because I think we're, I was between you and Ajanique and Ajanique yeah. is actually going to come on pretty soon because she's going to be talking about her book club that is all about um, profiling um, African American or black authors so I think mm -hmm. it's really cool that she's doing that and I'm part of that because you know I don't see color when I'm reading but you know I started thinking about it. I'm like yeah how many white authors get more accolades because they're white and they're not African Americans, so so I started learning more about that and being open to that as well. Yeah, I love that, and and that's funny because she was actually the only person I knew on the trip. I think beyond um, Kate and Andrea, so I was like, I, I love that they did that. I forgot that they did that actually. And because um, you know, because when you when you go to an event, you tend to stay with the person that you know, right, right, and reach out and reach. And I think that was probably one of the even though it was scary because I didn't know anybody because I was coming from Goldsboro and this was like a Raleigh blogger trip and everybody was kind of like, and then we sat down next to each other and you're like, Oh, you're from Goldsboro. Oh, I grew up in Mount Olive. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Look, yeah. Cause I meet people all the time who've never heard of Mount Olive. So I was excited to hear you're from Goldsboro. <laughs> Woo Mount Olive. Yes. So, I love it. So is there any one last thing that you would like to leave people with? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much again for having me on because this has been a really, really great conversation. I think the main thing I would leave with people right now is number one, wear your mask. <laughs> but um, beyond that, I would say um, I really want to encourage people to really step out and do something different in their lives. I think a lot of times we get so uh kind of stuck in our normal routine, but we have dreams that are bigger than that and that we have um, goals that are bigger than that. And there are things that, that have always been in the back of our minds that we wanted to do. 2020 has kind of showed us that we never know what is going to happen in this life. This has been a crazy year and we don't know how much time we have on this earth. So I need you to do whatever that thing is that you really want to do. And do you know that these chats from the blog cabin actually came out because of COVID that I wasn't doing that. I was always scared to step in front of the camera. I was always behind the camera okay. and I took a challenge and I was, um, the challenge was to go on a uh, live Instagram or Facebook 
and talk about one of our values and one of my core values is relationships and friendships and mm -hmm. it just started out that I started getting in front of the camera and I loved it so much and who now I'm hosting this talk show that I'm doing twice a week on Facebook I mean <laughs> that, and it's awesome and see that, that's that's the thing I know COVID has had a lot of negative uh, uh, you know effects on people but in a way it has really pushed people to to more into their destiny for some people and I feel like that's the beautiful part and I also want to use this um chats for good as well you know because yeah. I have the the profile, the women in race, that whole discussion, the honest, open and honest discussion. And then I had the male perspective. And then I also talked about one of the moms being, who's being pregnant during COVID. Um, a mom with a special needs child, why it's important to wear a mask. Yes. That was on last week. We talked about the imposter syndrome. We, I have so many great ones coming up. Um, in the future and already booked out. So I'm so excited that you were actually able to come on and do this. I mean, you were like at the end of July and I'm like, okay, let me look at the date. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I look, I even told my husband, I was like, yes, babe, look, I got this chat going on on Monday. We, I got a block this time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thank you so much, Ashley, for coming on and guys, oh, you. Her. where can we find you at? So my website is fabellis.com, which is F-A-B-E-L-L-I-S.com. And then also I am on all social media as I am Fab Ellis. And I love that because it's like I am fabulous. Is that, <laughs> kind of the, play? Is that the kind of the play or no? Or yeah, it is the play because um, I, don't, I didn't know you at the time, but Ellis is my maiden name. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, and I actually am, I still am Ashley Ellis. It's my middle name, but I'm Ashley Ellis Carter. But yeah, um, I, that was a play on words. So, I love that because you are Fab Ellis and you are Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Melissa. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Ashley. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Bye.